Well, good afternoon, and we're going to continue our study dealing with um, the lines simply presented. We're going to look at the beginning of modern Israel and the end of modern Israel, if we have the time. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the study here this afternoon and for all the light that you have shared with us over uh, the past year or so dealing with the lines. And I just pray, Lord, that as we look at these lines that relate to uh, Millerite history and our time, uh, that we can understand them clearly and simply. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we, you can use us to present these truths to others who are open and willing uh, to look at your word and who are searching for truth. And so help us to sort these details out in our minds and to study them for ourselves. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we've spent the last couple of studies on understanding the, or the line simply presented. And um, this, again, is Parminder studies from uh, 2015 that he presented in Alberta. And these cover the lines in a pretty straightforward way that we, how we would have understood them prior to the understanding of midnight as a symbol. We already have the midnight cry as a symbol, which we saw as the powerment of the second angel. And this is really just a review of Millerite history as we understood it in 2015. So there's obviously more that we understand presently than we did at that time. So again, we have this period of darkness. Now, to say it's the Dark Ages, I mean, it's it's partly true. The Dark Ages are actually a little bit earlier. You're, you're going to have, um, you know, the Protestant Reformation occur, which occurs not in what we would call the Dark Ages. I mean, there. so you have uh, the Reformation and you have the Renaissance. So those aren't really part of the Dark Ages, but we're just using the term Dark Ages here to refer to the 1260 years, right? So that period of 1260 years is a captivity, just as the 70 years in Babylon are, are they parallel that. So Ellen White says this in the statement from Prophets and Kings, God's church on earth was verily in captivity during this long period of relentless persecution, as were the children of Israel held captive in Babylon uh, during the period of the exile. <clears throat> so we know that a period of darkness um, that precedes a reform line, that the reform line addresses that a period of darkness. So the darkness is the doctrines that um, it's not just about the persecution. It's also the doctrines that were taught. Now, of course, during the Reformation, some Bible truths are uncovered. And so, when we get to this period in 1798, a message is going to come that's going to test the Protestants. And uh, that message is the message of God's judgment. It's also a message regarding the heavenly sanctuary, though it's not understood that way at first. And, and it's also really a call back uh, to the Sabbath. Because if we look at the first angel's message, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. Right. So it's quoting from the Sabbath commandment itself. So it's referring us back to the Sabbath commandment. But that's not discerned at the time. In fact, the Millerites never even understand that they're giving the first angel's message or even the second angel's message. This isn't really understood until after uh, 1844 that... Uh, Seventh-day Adventists, the, one, the Millerites who end up accepting the Sabbath, come to understand the third angel's message. And, and so that's when they, they then place uh, the first and second angel's message in Millerite history. So, so that's not something that the Millerites understood. They didn't think, oh, we're preaching the first angel message. Now we're preaching the second angel's message, and then the third angel's message is going to come. Um, they, they didn't have any idea about those messages and, and where to place them. 
Now, we talk here about the mystery of iniquity. So, so this is something that Parminder puts in his line. That is, there is a darkness that exists uh, here at the time that we have this first message. Um, now, there's this apostasy that allows the papacy to arise. Right. So um, this is dealing with Second Thessalonians. So he's going back and referring to what we would call the daily. And this is something that the Millerites come to understand. They start to understand uh, both the pagan and papal desolating powers. Now, this section here um, from the Great Controversy, uh, it's page 49, paragraph 1 and paragraph 2, addressing Second Th Thessalonians, is Ellen White's commentary on the pioneer understanding of the daily. Right. So, you know, often people will say, well, Ellen White says nothing about the daily. But if you read uh, the chapter, which is entitled, I can't remember, but it's the one, it's one of the, the early chapters. It's not the first one. It's the second or third chapter in Great Controversy. It addresses Second Thessalonians and it's it's laying out the pioneer understanding of the two desolating powers. So. Uh, that's what's being addressed there. And then we have this time of the end. So you have this period of darkness, this mystery of iniquity, which has to do with these two desolating powers. And now you have the time of the end. So that's going to be 1798 at the end of this 1260 years of papal persecution. Now, we're not going to read all of these because they're things we're very familiar with. Um, and now, one of the things that if you were to ask the average Seventh-day Adventist, uh, they probably not know much about this at all, but if you asked a conservative Adventist who believed in this, uh, the time of the end of 1798, and if you asked them when the first angel arrived, um, they might place that in, uh, you know, in the time when they were proclaiming them, they might say it's when, uh, Miller began proclaiming the message and so forth. But uh, we know that the parable of the 10 virgins applies uh, to this history of Millerite history. So the going forth of the virgins applies to the first message and uh, the tarrying time is the second message, Ellen White says. But this idea of a message arriving, a message formalized, formalized, being formalized, and a message empowered, this isn't, isn't something that most Adventists would know anything about. Um, but we would know that if we were to look at these lines, we would definitely see that the first angel must arrive in 1798. And there's a number of ways that we could show that. Um, you know, so Ellen White doesn't say anywhere specifically, the first angel arrived in 1798. But when you look at what she talks about with the book of Daniel being unsealed, she talks about Miller and his conversion, and she talks about then, you know, everything that's going to happen, his studying of the scriptures and his first understanding that those, that Jesus is coming back in about 25 years and then also, of course, his first preaching, 1831, and then in 1833, receiving his credentials. So she goes through that history, and we can definitely draw those on the line. Now, we've chosen these expressions. The first angel arrives, right? And, you know, it's formalized and it's empowered um, just to describe what's happening in a line. And so, so we can mark these events, but the the way that we describe them is something that we we develop. Now, of course, in empowerment of a message, you know, there's an impetus that comes to the message on August 11th, 1840, which we get to. So, so when we read about this as Seventh Day Adventists, we should be able to see that that the way that we describe this history is correct, even if it's not specifically described this way in the spirit of prophecy.
So, so after the message arrives, we have this increase of knowledge. Um, so if we look at this statement, Great Controversy 356, no such message has ever been given in past ages. Dan, talking about Daniel 12, verse 4. Paul, as we have seen, did not preach it. He pointed his brethren into the then far distant future for the coming of the Lord. The reformers did not proclaim it. Martin Luther placed the judgment about 300 years in the future from his day. But since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed. Knowledge of the prophecies has increased, and many have proclaimed the solemn message of the judgment year. So you can see she puts the start of this unsealing of a message, the book of Daniel being unsealed, back to 1798. So how we describe these things, we've, we've created some terminology that isn't specifically stated in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, but it's consistent with the ideas. It's just a way to describe this. <clears throat> Uh, so talking about Miller, with intense interest, he studied the book of Daniel and Revelation, employing the same principles of interpretation as in the other scriptures, and found, to his great joy, that the prophetic symbols could be understood. He saw that the prophecies, so far as they had been fulfilled, had been fulfilled literally, that all the various figures, metaphors, parables, similitudes, etc., were either explained in their immediate connection or the terms in which they were expressed were defined in other scriptures. And when thus explained, were to be literally understood. Thus was I satisfied, he says, that the Bible was a system of revealed truth so clearly and simply given that the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err therein. Link after link of the chain of truth rewarded his efforts. As step by step, he traced down the great lines of prophecy. Angels of heaven were guiding his mind and opening the scriptures to his understanding. So Great Controversy, that's the 1888 edition of the Great Controversy, um, page 320, paragraph 2. And when it comes to um, this idea of the link after link of the great chain of truth, one of the things that we have done in understanding the lines is is seeing how these lines are connected so we can see that the lines uh, progress uh, in in a way that uh, we have a reform line we have a period of, of four generations and which can be different kinds of symbols attached to that different periods and ways in which it's expressed those periods are expressed but then you will then have a period of darkness and another reform line. And that each reform line also has, uh, each of the way marks can be a reform line as well. So this is consistent with what we see here in Millerite history. In fact, uh, Millerite history is uh, the template that we have used to, to understand reform lines. Now, the formalization of the message. So Miller receives his credentials, 1833 to 1834. So we just normally mark 1833. So he received his license to preach from the Baptist church. Um, in 1833, two years after Miller began to present in public the evidences of Christ's incoming, the last of the signs appeared which were promised by the Savior as tokens of his second advent said Jesus, the star shall fall from heaven, and John in the Revelation declared as he beheld in vision the scenes that should herald the day. The stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This prophecy received a striking and impressive fulfillment in the great meteoric shower of November 13, 1833. So this is going to be the year in which Miller receives his credentials. <clears throat> now, um, so if we go here, um, let me see. I'll find this for you. Because one of the things about... Um, 
Miller's Miller has his own personal line. Um, but I'm not going to look at that so much, just some of the stuff in his history. Okay. So this is a line which I, I drew out before. And just to sort of address some of of what we see here, here in Miller Millerite history. So there's a lot here on this, this chart that we, we don't want to look at. <clears throat> but if we look at 1833, it's going to be May 19th, 1833 on this chart that Miller receives his credentials. May 19th, 1833. Um, I have it. Here, yeah. So that's going to be uh, Miller's receives his credentials on May nineteenth. Uh, the falling of the stars is going to happen on November thirteenth, eighteen thirty three, and on September fourteenth. So that's sixty days before that. Um, Miller is going to. Uh, be ordained. So he receives his court, uh, um, his, uh, what's the word here? Credentials, and then he's going to be ordained in the same year. But it's in, in the year that the falling of the stars occurs, right? So we know on February 17th, or pardon me, February 15th, 1798. Uh, the Pope is going to be taken captive. That marks the time of the end. And um, Miller is going to be um, – because he's born in 1872, so he's going to be 16 uh, – So he's born 16 days from the start of the year in the 46th day of the year. I don't know what that means. Um, but anyway, he's going to be uh, 16 years old, right? February 15, 1798. And in 1798, he receives his concordance. So we can see that in Miller's history, there is this unfolding of this increase of light or of knowledge that's going to result in his formalization of this message. So, so he receives a concordance. He's going to begin a study in 1816 uh, and going to be completing that in 1818. And, and then he's going to be asked to preach in 1831. And then he's going to receive his credentials and be ordained in 1833. And that's going to be the year when the stars fall. So, um, so what is this connection then between the falling of the stars and why is this connected with Miller's ordination with the formalization of the message, I guess, is the question. Why do we connect these? I mean, they happen in the same year, but Ellen White puts these together. And so what is the reason? There's not many of you here, so somebody's going to have to speak up if you know. I'm figuring that just as God commands the stars to fall, he commands commands his, his envoys to, to go to earth to enlighten us. Yeah, so, so the falling of the stars is one of the tokens, right? There are tokens of that are announcing this coming judgment. We first, of course, have uh, uh, the Lisbon earthquake, and then we have um, the, dark, um, the dark day, um, and then we're going to have, have the falling of the stars. So we have these events uh, that continue, and these are all uh, tokens right, of what is to come. 
and um, just hang on a sec here. So it's it's in God's providence that Miller receives his credentials because he's now a minister. Uh, and he has these tokens in hand, so to speak, in warning the world. That is, these signs of the times he can point to. And so these, this, so this is connected with the formalization of the message. Now, they're going to make a prediction, and that's going to result in the empowerment of that first angel's message. So we know in 1840... August 11th, that, that this is going to occur. So in the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 19, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in AD 40, sometime in the month of August. And only a few days previous to it, to its accomplishment, he wrote, allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before Dracozis ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years, 15 days, commenced at the close of the first period. It will end on August 11th, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken, and this, I believe, will be found to be the case. At the very time specified, Turkey through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. Now, this becomes a really important part of this movement in accepting August 11th, 1840, and understanding how it's connected to 9-11 and also to our proclamation of July 18, 2020. And I don't think it's something that's actually well understood in the movement. That is, people may know about August 11th, 1840, um, but I don't know if many people understand the chronology of it and how we connected it to July 1820 and how, um, how it's relevant in understanding our lines especially where we are at the present time. So we, we keep using these symbols, but we don't fully understand what they mean. But that's the empowerment of the first angel. So when we look at our history, that is, because uh, remember, this is the beginning of modern Israel. When we look at the end of modern Israel, we will see how that parallels with our history. Of course, we sort of know because we've studied this, but there are things that we still need to understand more fully. Now, during this period of time, then, what you're going to see is there's this worldwide message, right? So Revelation chapter 10, and then there's a testing that occurs. Now, when we look at this Revelation 10, um, because this statement here is one that's in um, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary volume, what they call 7a, uh, I think it's page... Uh, pages it they don't show the pages here because they're showing it from a manuscript release um this is uh camp 976 something like that uh, the mighty angel who instructed john was no less a personage than jesus christ setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the dry land shows the part which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy with satan the position denotes his supreme power and authority over the whole earth. The controversy is waxed stronger and more determined from age to age and will continue to do so to the concluding scenes when the masterly working of the powers of darkness shall reach their height. Um, and I think the statement in 7a is slightly different, but uh, the message of Revelation 14 proclaiming the hour of God's judgment is come, is given in the time of the end, and the angel of Revelation 10 is represented as having one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, showing that the message will be carried to distant lands, the ocean will be crossed, and the islands of the sea will hear the proclamation of the last message of warning to our world. 
Now, one of the things about Revelation 10, uh, this was used by Daniel from Brazil in understanding when the message was given on uh, June, uh, June 10th, 2018 by Parminder, that he counted 126 days inclusively uh, to October 13th, uh, uh, 2018, and believed that this represented this carrying of the message from uh, the area that's called the sea, that's the populated area, uh, to the land, which is the United States. So from Italy to um, uh, America. So there's, there's some things there that we haven't really addressed or studied too much in detail. And then you have this uh, testing that happens with this message, right? Um, and then we have the foundations being laid. So we have this message given, it's empowered, right? it's formalized, empowered, and then we have foundations are laid. And that, that's going to be the 1843 chart, May of 1842. Now, uh, the 1843 chart um, It is, um, it is first presented where? When, when is this chart made? Here's, here's a chart of the chart. <clears throat> so the publication of the chart is in 1843, the chart was authorized by the Gen 11th General Conference of the Miller Millerite Movement, which convened at Boston on May 24th, 1842. Uh, 36 days later, which is an inclusive count, uh, the first Millerite camp meeting was held at East Kingston from June 28th to July 5th, 1842. And it is here that the 1843 chart was first presented. 777 days later is the start of the Exeter camp meeting. So we have the first Millerite camp meeting in East Kingston, and then uh, 777 days later, we have the Exeter camp meeting. Um, and these are all inclusive counts, uh, pretty much, except the three days there. That's uh, cardinal count at the end. Um, so there is 780 days from when the charts are first presented to the midnight cry, which we haven't got to yet. But um, so when we look at these charts, this is, uh, is being described as laying of the foundation. Now, of course, the foundation is being laid, but it's, we can say it's completed once it's put on the chart. And we call it the 1843 chart, because it shows the end in 1843. The 1850 chart is made in 1850. The 1843 chart is made in 1842. And they make 300 of these charts. And um, we know that 780 days is 18,720 hours. And then it's uh, 815 days from the publication of the chart to the midnight cry. And of course, 815 represents August 15th, 1844. So it's a pretty interesting uh, chart. So this wouldn't be something we would know uh, back in 2015, but I think it's, it's an important point in understanding the connection between the laying of the foundations, the work of the enemies and why the second angels uh, message then has to arrive. So you lay these foundations, and then you're going to have the work of the enemies, right? The activity of the enemies, he calls it here. So why do the Protestants close their doors in June of 1842? So in May, they make the chart, but it's in June of 1842 that the making of this chart gets this response. Ellen White says the second course created much more excitement in the city than the first, talking about these course of lectures. 
With few exceptions, the different denominations closed the doors of their churches against Mr. Miller. Many discourses from the various pulpits sought to expose the alleged fanatical errors of the lecturer, but crowds of anxious listeners attended his meetings while many were unable to enter the house. Satan and his angels were busily engaged in seeking to attract the minds of as many as possible from the light of the first angel's message. The company who rejected it were left in darkness. I saw the angel of God watching with deepest interest his professed people to recover, to record the character which they developed as the message of heavenly origin was presented to them. And as very many who professed love for Jesus turned from the heavenly message, the scorn, derision, and hatred, an angel with a parchment in his hand made the shameful record. All heaven was filled with indignation that Jesus should be thus slighted by his professed followers. So one of the things that is interesting, when we look at these, and this would relate to our understanding of the lines, we haven't always addressed the work of the enemies or the attack of the enemies, activities of the enemies in, in a line. But when we look at, at our lines that uh, presently exist, that are internal, one of the things that we could see is that the activity of the enemies still exists, right? So it's, um, we don't usually address it, but in our internal lines, it's often gonna be internal enemies. <clears throat> now, of course, we know the second angel then arrives April 19th, 1844. So what's going to happen is when they, the Millerites uh, begin their, their camp meetings um, and the Protestants begin to close their doors, uh, that message begins to uh, uh, propagate you know, very quickly. Uh, the camp meetings are very successful. They have this big tent uh, everywhere they go. It's a sensation. People are wanting to hear what's being said. The newspapers are reporting, sometimes favorably, sometimes not favorably. Um, definitely, they were much more favorable early on. They're becoming much more antagonistic as the year 1843 approaches, and especially to the end of that period. Now, they actually have a number of other disappointments. Um, so even when they get to the Jewish year, 1843, people are expecting that uh, Christ would return in the spring of 1843, the fall of 1843, uh, December 31st, 1843. Um, but it's really their first real disappointment that hits them hard and they re realize that their hopes have been dashed is the morning of April 19th, 1844. So... <clears throat> When that happens, they don't really have an answer to their disappointment. And they enter in what is called the tearing time. And that's based upon, though the vision, tarry, wait for it, from Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Um, now, also, Ellen White is going to refer us here to the parable of the ten virgins. So one of the things about the ten virgins is the bridegroom, while the bridegroom tarries, you know, the virgins slumber right and there's so there's this whole illustration that comes from this parable of the ten virgins <clears throat> also we know at the same time another message begins to arrive in adventism and that's going to be the message that babylon has fallen has fallen um i can't think of the guy's name who who promotes this but anyway in our uh, the Three Angels Message is source, source book. It's going to have his name. I just can't think of it. Um, but anyway, this becomes part of their message. Because the Protestants have closed their doors, they now begin to recognize that the Protestants are also part of Babylon. You see this reject, rejection of this message. So these two messages go hand in hand. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And also... Um, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. These are going to be messages that are going to be proclaimed under the second angel's message. Now, these messages arrive at the end of Miller's prophecy, um, but they've been 
already beginning prior to that. But they, we say they arrive because that's when they arrive for the movement. That's when the movement recognizes that this disappointment that they're in the tearing time. Now the empowerment, so you're going to see here, we have the second angel empowered, but we don't see anything about the formalization of this message in Parminder's study. And, and why would that be? Why, won't, why don't we have midnight here and the formalization of the message at midnight? Why do we just jump to the midnight cry? So the reason would be that we we don't even have the way mark midnight back in 2015. We're not going to come to understand that until uh, the end of 2015, the beginning of 2016. <clears throat> now, the understanding of August 15th, 1844, that came about in 2014, though on August 31st, 2013 I'd figured it out but um, I wasn't a major part of the movement so it wasn't until uh, Noel presented it uh, in the camp meeting in the summer of 2014 so nearly about 10 months afterwards that um, the movement uh, begins to understand August 15th 1844 specifically that this is uh, the first day of the fifth month. Now we know of Exeter, so I shouldn't say that we we don't we know of the Exeter camp meeting, but we don't know about August fifteenth. So we we know about this event as it's reported by Loughborough, um, but we really haven't sorted it out even in two thousand fifteen because we don't understand midnight, and in fact we really didn't sort it out until this last year that we have a, a solid way of understanding uh, midnight and the midnight cry, the timing and the events that occurred. Now, um, so Ellen White's going to write about this. Uh, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. Um, this was the midnight cry, which was to give power to the second angel's message. So we can see how when we talk about an empowerment of the message, it comes from uh, these types of statements in the spirit of prophecy. Angels were sent from heaven to arouse the discouraged saints and prepare them for the great work before them. The most talented men were not the first to receive the message. Angels were sent to the humble devoted ones and constrained them to raise the cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now, um, this is not necessarily, um, when, when Ellen White talks about midnight, when the message comes, she talks about midway, and that's going to be July 21st. Uh, but when she talks about this empowerment of the message, this is going to be near the close of the second angel's message. So that's going to be in August. So this, this is not generally understood by Seventh-day Adventists. And we conflate the events of Boston with the events of Exeter. So Samuel Snow doesn't ride up in a horse in Exeter. That's in Boston. And uh, so what occurs at um, uh, in Exeter, we have a paper on it dealing with the midnight cry on August 15th. It's on my academia site. And um, so we address all of that from the, from the testimony of Joseph Bates, who was there, and James White. And then we look at Loughborough's and Spalding's uh, confusion regarding that. So we know uh, Boston is where that's at midnight, that's midway. That's where he first gives his message publicly. But it's not going to be empowered till, till Exeter, so <clears throat> 25 days later. Um, now we have the third angel arriving. So this is going to be the time of the judgment, the day of atonement, Christ's ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. We're all familiar with this as Seventh-day Adventists. 
and that October 22nd, 1844, is the arrival of the second angel's message, or pardon me, third angel's message. So that should be well understood by Adventists. It's not understood by all. But then we know this is the great disappointment. So Jesus doesn't come as expected. So in a line, uh, we get to this third angel arriving. There's always going to be a disappointment. And also a number seven attached. Now, the number seven here, we apply to the Sabbath, right? So that so with that event, our attention is drawn to the ark in the sanctuary in which uh, the Ten Com Commandments are seen. That's what she's going to be saying here. Um, so the Sabbath becomes uh, this important point um, that had been neglected by Protestants for a long, long time. Now, there's also this covenant. Aaron Ellen White's going to be married in 1846. And, and they're going to come to understand the Sabbath um, in the fall of that year. So after they get married. So shortly after. So, you know, they don't understand right as soon as the third angel arrives that, um, you know, that it has arrived. So they're going to understand this later. Now, when it comes to the formalization of this message, um, they're not really going to address it here specifically. But the third angel arrives. Um, they're just going to jump to that the third angel is joined by the fourth angel. So we know the third angel arrives October 22nd, 1844. Now, we are in the proclamation of this third angel. So it arrives then. But the fourth angel is going to join with the third, and that's going to swell into a loud cry. So I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to the earth and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth, to unite his voice with the third angel, and to give power and force to his message. Great power and glory were imparted to the angel, and as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. The light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere. As he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The message of the fall of Babylon, as given by the second angel, is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes, comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation, which they are soon to meet. Um, I saw great light resting upon them and they united in fearlessly united to fearlessly proclaim the third angel's message. So one of the things that we see here, that when it comes to the fourth angel, what we call the fourth angel, which is the second angel, right? It's going to join with the third. It's going to be this call, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people, Right? Now, this is not something that was actually attached to uh, the second angel's message in Millerite history. It doesn't, there is not a call to come out of Babylon in the verse itself. Uh, the Millerites often conflated the two. They mixed the angel of Revelation 18 with that of Revelation 14 with the second angel. Um, but we can see that it's actually later. So the fact that the second angel's message is repeated in scripture uh, is one of the things that shows us this repeat of history. And it, and it seems kind of odd for Seventh-day Adventists because we understand the repeat of history. That when they see that this message joins with the third angel and that you can't have a, a, a second without a first because you can't have a third without a first and second that these net messages need to be repeated. But she plainly says 
The message of the fall of Babylon, as given by the second angel, is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. And so when it comes, it will swell into a loud cry. So this is not really well understood because we don't understand Millerite history. It's difficult for us to understand our history. And this would have been my problem before I was in this movement. I mean, I would read these statements in early writings, but I didn't really understand what they were talking about. Because I didn't know what, how the second angel's message was given in Millerite history. I mean, I knew that they recognized that the Protestant churches constituted Babylon, but I didn't really understand the lines. And so saying that the message is repeated didn't suggest to my mind, oh, we're going to have to repeat, you know, the first angel's message and that, you know, we have this line in Millerite history and this line must repeat. <clears throat> now, this next one here, um, this becomes really, really pertinent when we look at our history, because they're saying that this fourth angel's message arriving is our history. But really, um, you still need the four generations prior to our history. And, and that's, again, I, I don't think generally understood even in our movement. Because here at this time in 2015, they're just going to jump right to the end as the fourth angel arriving. But there is a fourth angel uh, that arrives in Millerite history. That is when we look at um, 1863. And then we're going to have uh, the third angel again. It's going to be rejected in 1888. So... So that doesn't really make much sense to me now. When when we look at what we understood, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to leave that history out to just jump to uh, our history like that. But of course, we do right. That's that's how we have done it. Now combining the message messages, the Lord is about to punish the world for its iniquity. He is about to punish religious bodies for the rejection of the light and truth which has been given the great message combining the first, second and third angels messages is to be given to the world. This is to be the burden of the work. So Adventists don't understand that we have to give the first and second angels message. Generally, they just think about the third angels message though. Ellen White has said that the second angel is going to join the third angel uh, to um, impart power and glory, right? Right, so power and glory is gonna be imparted to this uh, because the second angel is gonna unite its voice with the third angel. But we can see here that we also have the first angel's message. So the great message combines all of these messages. Now, we see in the Adventist Sabbath School quarterly that they're studying the three cosmic messages but they're not addressing the timing of the first and second and third angels messages. They're just addressing these messages more in some kind of abstract way without any understanding of their, their history. So people are not getting a sense that would, it wouldn't make sense. If we talk about the great message is combining the first and second and third angels messages, but we don't know how those messages were fulfilled because they have to be repeated because they were already given. The first, second, and third angels' messages were already given, and they have to be repeated. And that happens under, because we're under the proclamation of the third, but it happens when the second angel joins the third angel. And, of course, we mark that as 9-11. So we'll see that when we go into... Uh, uh, reform line number four, the end of modern Israel. <clears throat> so, so there's the summary of the beginning of modern Israel, but I think we're missing out. And so I just want to draw on, on 
what I think, what I believe is missing from this presentation, as I talked about. So I'll just quickly go there. So here we have Millerite history. We can see 1798. Still sharing. I'm still sharing, thanks. I always forget that. That's better. So I'm not going to put all the dates here. Second angel arrives. So we're going to have April 19th. July 21st. August 15th. And October 22. Okay. So there we have that whole line that we would understand. Now, of course... This is the third angel arriving. And we know that if we take this line from the third angel arriving, that we would have to have the third angel formalized and we would have to have the third angel empowered, right? So this, this would have to occur, right? So Ellen White is saying that the third angel is empowered at Revelation 18. So when is the third angel formalized? Would this be 1888? If we just... Now, we don't usually deal with the third angel being formalized. That is, in every line that we come to, we come to um, the third angel arriving. We never talk about its in, in, in formalization and empowerment. Because in every other line, when we get to the third angel arriving, here, I'll erase this again. Just do this simpler or simply. So when we look at a line and we go like this, we got the first, the second, and the third. And then we say we have a fourth. Right? But when we have a fourth, we also have a second and a first and a third. And in every reform line, when we have this, this occurs in the first generation. That is, there's this period that we would call the first generation, however we want to mark it. But we have this occur. That is, there is a reform line that occurs after a reform line. But it's often what I call the failed reform line. That is, it is a reform line. But it, in some ways, undoes what is done in this history. Now, the way that we describe this in our history was a falling away. Now, we would connect this with Laodicea, right, et cetera. And, and we see this, of course, in the three decrees. And then the fourth decree, under Nehemiah's decree, there's this work that's accomplished, but it, it's 
because it's a reform line dealing with the Sabbath. But we see that what ends up happening when we get to the fourth generation, they're just legalists. This one deals with the strange wives. By the fourth generation, they're exclusive. So these this history here ends up leading to the four generations progressively uh, rejecting the message where we have a period of darkness and then we have a reform line. But in our history, we have something that hasn't occurred in any other reform line. And that is we do have a formalization and empowerment of the third angel. So we don't see this in other histories. So this makes our history unique. So Ellen White would see this, right? And then she's gonna see the loud cry, right? Because this is gonna be the second angel, which is the fourth. So we get this loud cry, and then we get the close of probation, the seven plagues, second coming, etc. right? So we're going to look at, at our history next week in a little bit more detail. So any final thoughts or questions? Is this where we're going to start next week? The end of modern Israel. And this line's a little more complicated than the other lines because we have to sort some things out about this line that we didn't understand in 2015. Um, so let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. And I pray that those who watch this video will be blessed, that your Holy Spirit will attend them. And I pray, Lord, that you can um, help us as we continue to study and present and share. We know, Lord, that there's still much we do not understand. But we just ask that uh, you can continue uh, to correct us when we are in error and to guide us into all truth. Be with us until we come again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.